to a few scriptures that I have written out here for uh, what I, if I want, would call it a text, I wouldn't know whether they call it a text or not, but just for a text, I want to take this thought. God's word calls for a total separation from unbelief. And now I wish to read it out of the Bible, over in the book of Genesis, the 13th chapter of Genesis, and we wish to start with the fifth verse to read. I just love to read the word because what I say could fail. That's a man. But if I just read this word, what he says can't fail. So then I know there will be good come out of it if no more than just reading the word. The fifth verse we begin of the thirteenth chapter. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and Persianite dwelt in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And if thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest out of Zorah. Then Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated themselves one from the other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the city of the plains and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abraham, After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou hast northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give thee, and to thy seed forever. Now the thought of God's word calling a total separation. We only know this by as we read the word and see the word uh, manifest itself. Now in the beginning, Genesis 1, 3, we find that there was darkness upon the earth, and the Spirit of God moved upon the water and said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. So the Word of God began to separate the light from the darkness from the beginning. So does it remain to this day. As I said last night of Jesus. When he was only 12 years old, and being a mistake of his mother, who is claimed by people to be the mother of God, and how that the woman said, While thy father and I have sought thee with tears, and quickly he, being the word, said, Knowest thou not that I must be about my father's business? See, she was declaring him to be Joseph's son, but he wasn't Joseph's son. If he had been Joseph's son, he has been with him, but he was with the Father about his business. So the Word is always corrective and always right, and the Word will correct ever wrong. Always. Now when the earth that God was going to use the earth, and it was in total darkness, the Spirit of God spoke out and said, Let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness. And it's been doing that ever since, separating light from darkness. God's Word also separated the water from the land in the beginning. 
God spoke and the water was separated from the land so that he had a, a reason for that. God never speaks a word unless he's got a reason for speaking that word. He's not like you and I that we just, or especially myself, that speaks so many foolish things. God speaks every word with a meaning and something that he's trying to achieve and will achieve by his word. And it will perform exactly what he said it will do. Now, if God said, let there be light, and there was no light, then that, that, isn't, uh, that wasn't God who said that. When God says anything, he must back up what he says. Yes. And when the word of God has been vindicated, the word been vindicated, that is light. Now, the word itself isn't light until it's a vindicated light. If God said, let there be light, and there was no light, then it wasn't the word of God. But when light sprung upon the earth, that showed the word was vindicated, and it was light. Now, today, if God has made a promise, and when that promise is vindicated, then that is light. That's the light of the day when the word is vindicated, the word for the hour is vindicated. Then God was going to have a, a earth that he was going to grow vegetation and have people up on the earth. And then he spoke and separated the waters from the sea. Then also he separated in Genesis life from death. Now, if we believe the word of God, it is the word of life to us. Right. But if we question the word of God, it's death to us. For God has spoken, who can deny it? And if we question the word of God, then it becomes death, like Eve. Now, Eve questioned one little phase of God's word. And what did it do? It caused all this trouble that we have. If she would remain behind the word, fortified, behind the word, the whole armor of God, and not disbelieved it, then it would have never had the way it has. It had never been this way. But you see, there came death. Then God also had an atonement. Being merciful to us, he accepted a substitute death for their death, which both he separated life from death also in the Garden of Eden, and he did it by his word. And today he does the same thing. When we're in gross darkness, as I spoke on Sunday, Darkness upon the land, upon the people in gross darkness. In the midst of all of this, he's still speaking his word of life to those who want to believe it. And now we find that if um, Jesus has constantly told us that there's a separation, and we find that the last thing that's predicted to the human race before the great final day when we ascend into the presence of God there will be a final separation. He will separate the sheep from the goats. God will uh, continually has been separating, separating. And that's what he's doing tonight. It's what he always does. You can see it in every meeting. He separates faith from unbelief. He speaks out. He declares himself to those who will believe him, have faith in him. Now we find out in Numbers, the sixth chapter, that a Nazarite's call, a Nazarite call was to separate themselves from all the world to the Word of God. Now, that is a Nazarite call, separated. We find out that Samson was a Nazarite unto the Lord, and he was separated from the, uh, uh, by a sign. And this sign was that he was to wear his hair long with seven locks. It was a, a sign of separation, that he was called for a purpose. And I don't want to get started on this, because I said that it, I was just going to speak a few minutes. But I think today when we see our sisters wearing long hair, as the Bible said they should, I think it's a Nazarite sign that they want to follow the Lord. I know that sounds flat, and I, I, I want it to go home, see, because it is. It looks like somebody is trying to, to do, keep a, uh, something that God told them to do. No matter what the price the world uh, has to say about it out there, how many scornful or laughers or 
critics, that doesn't bother a person that's totally separated from the things of the world to the things of God. They'll obey the word and separate themselves Amen. from the things of the world because the word separates them. I know they stand criticism, but if we wasn't criticized, then there'd be something wrong. The world always knows its own. But as I've said, that remember, criticism on the count of the word of God is only growing pains of his grace. It shows that you have separated yourself uh, to be a Christian, to act like one, to live like one, to obey every commandment of God. And it's a, it's a Nazarite vow to separate a call from God that separates you from the things of the world. I believe tonight that every man and woman, every boy and girl that's born of the Spirit of God is a Nazarite unto the Lord Amen. because they have separated them things themselves from the cares of the world. And whatever the world's got to say, you live in this city here where there's great schools and, and we see our nation calling for a higher standard of education, which is all right, nothing to say about that, but that education cannot give you salvation. A scientist can split a grain of wheat and tell you how many different uh, chemicals is in it, but it can't find the life that's in there. An education can learn you or teach you mathematics and, and it can teach you history and whatever more, but it cannot bring life to you. Your education will not do that. God has one way of bringing life to you. That's when you're ready to separate yourself from all the things of the world and all the the cares of the world, and clean only to God's promised word. Paul was a Nazarite unto the Lord. He was separated from his Orthodox church to the word of the living God. Aaron was a Nazarite unto the Lord. He was separated from among the brethren to bear the birth stones and to be the high priest. It is a total separation. We're not to go back into the world no more or have anything to do with the world, but cleave only unto God. Jesus is coming after a bride, a woman, a church that's separated from the things of the world or the cares of the world. She's separated from the fashions of this modern age that we live in. She's separated from the the cares and the traditions of churches. She's separated only to God, and God is the Word. And his husband and wife is one, so does the bride, and the Word become one, for the Word's living to the bride. Amen. That's, how, that's her credentials. That's her identification. If I could pull out a, a Ph.D. or L.L.D. and show you my credentials from certain organization or from some school, that school would recognize that credential. But the only credential that a believer has is the Word of God living in him, declaring Jesus Christ lives in that person. That's a separated Nazarite unto the Lord, separated for the Word's sake. The Bible said the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword cutting to the sunder and the mire of the bone and discerns the thought that's in the heart. That's the reason Jesus could look upon the people and perceive what they were thinking. He was the Word. Now the first Adam that was born in the world, or not born, but created by God, the first Adam separated himself from the Word to his wife. Now he could have stayed with the Word if he wished to. But he separated himself from the Word to be with his wife. That's exactly what the common, carnal church member does today. Separates themselves from the true living Word to hold to their church. Where the Eve put a question upon the Word whether God would punish or not. Satan put the question. Eve believed it. And then when the church today puts the question upon the word, is he the same? Does he still uh, live in his church and per, uh, perform his signs and miracles that he did when he was here on earth, which he so surely promised us in St. John 14, 12, 
He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Even greater than this shall he do, for I go to my Father. These signs shall follow them that believe, shall follow them. The question is, the, the people today, does he really mean it? And when you accept what the church says, does he really mean it? Then you put yourself in the same condition that Adam did and join yourself with the, the woman of the church of the, this world and separate yourself from the blessings that God has promised to every believer that would separate himself from the world to the word. Now that's the truth. We are, have had the privilege of living in the day that when the word of God that we've seen is lauded through each age for certain things to happen. And when this is lauded, sometimes the man wonder how it's going to be done. Professors have their own idea. But in them ages, God has always sent forth his prophet. And the word of the Lord comes to the prophet and vindicates the word to that generation. And the prophets is always the Nazarite, separated from everything else to obey the word of God. Remember what Peter and John said, is it right for us to obey man or God? When they questioned them about the experience of Pentecost. Now, the first man separated himself, the first Adam, from the word to go with his wife that questioned whether God kept his word or not. What a perfect type of the lukewarm, carnal-minded believer today that still wants to cling with what the tradition says instead of taking what the Word says. That's it. A very real type. He was separated to his wife. The carnal believer is separated from the Word to the church. But when the second Adam was created in the womb of a woman and came to the world, he was a Nazarite to the Word of God. He was separated from the world to the Word. Now, Hebrews, the seventh chapter, 26 verse, tells us that. That them priests continually died. But this Jesus is holy and separated from sinners. Sin is unbelief. There was no unbelief found in him nowhere. When he was here on earth, he said, Who can condemn me of sin? Sin is unbelief. If I haven't done just what was prophesied for this age, if I haven't met the requirements of what Messiah is supposed to do, then don't believe me. Then search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me, tell you who he is. Because it had been prophesied since Eden that there would come a Savior. The prophet said he'd be born of a virgin. And how that he'd be called Emmanuel. And also he was a counselor, the Prince of Peace, mighty God. And that's what they accused him of, making himself God. He was God. Amen. And he was the Prince of Peace, the mighty God, and the everlasting Father. There's no other Father but him, spiritually speaking. He's the only Father, the Father of us all. And we find all believers he is the Father of, all who will believe his word. For he was completely separated from the church from his traditions, from his mother, from the world, and only did that which pleased the Father. Now, he was a different person from Adam. No matter what anybody questioned, to him the word, it was the word always first. And he proved that the word was right. When Satan tried to whitewash it for him and said, it's written, he said, yes, and it's also written. He withstood Satan upon the Word because that's what he was, the Word. In the Bible, uh, first John, St. John, the first chapter, said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's always a connection with the spoken Word of God, God's promise for the day. And when it comes... It's so unusual that people can hardly grasp it because we're so sowed into to forms and ideas of our own that it's hard for us to grasp what's truth. I think much of that would apply to, to Joseph in the days of, of the, the uh, 
of Mary in her maternity. She, she was to be mother, and Joseph loved her, and he, he wanted to believe. He was a righteous man, a good man, and he wanted to believe that story that Mary was telling him. But still there was a question that now she's a good woman. No doubt Mary had explained to him the visit of Gabriel to her, and the, he was a just man and the lineage of David. And yet her, it looked like that she was trying to use him for a shield to take off her reproach, because if she was engaged to him and to be found in this condition was the same as adultery, Deuteronomy tells us so, and would be stoned for the act. And it looked like that she, she was using him for a shield, and the man a good man. A just man, the Bible said he was, a just man, but her case was so unusual that he could not grasp it. He would look in her lovely face and the sincerity and honesty that she would tell her story in, and no doubt, but he'd go to his home or his carpenter shop say, I, I just can't see how she would tell me wrong, but the case is so unusual. If he would have only searched the scriptures that a virgin is to conceive. See, it was so unusual to him because it was out of the line of his thinking. But she is exactly in the scripture. And so is it today, brethren, that the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. and his promised word of power is so unusual. Good man, stumble over it. It's too unusual. They say that the dead was raised up, the blind see, the deaf hear, the Holy Spirit discerns the thoughts, foretells things that's coming to pass, never fail at one time. Or oh, they, they can't, can't grasp it. It's so unusual, so they, they uh, say, well, it's a telepathy or it's an evil spirit, just like they did in that day. The unusualness of the Word of God. But when a man is born in the world for an a believer, he becomes a Nazarite when he separates himself from anything that's contrary to the Word, a total separation. Jesus said, I come to separate a man from his wife, tear up a family, and he that won't uh, take up his cross and follow me is not worthy to be called mine. A separation from everything, anything from church, from from a community, from a belief, or from family, or anything that would stand between you and believing the entire Word of God if your soul will not punctuate every promise for this hour with an amen, there's something wrong somewhere. You need a separation. So Jesus was the Word made flesh, and he was completely separated from sinners, unbelievers. That the word itself flowed completely and, and thoroughly flew through him. That he said, I do nothing until I see the Father do it first. They just asked him, questioned him about things. He said, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. Watch, everything that he said was perfect. Just, he had not to ask about it, think about it, it was perfect. And his perfect truth always separated the truth from error. Even as I quote back again and again, his mother said, Thy father and I, before those priests that should already testify it was the virgin born son. But in the moments of her grief, how could a twelve year old boy, and we have no record of him even being in school, how could his intelligence be so great as to debate with the priest? Sage learned man. And why, when she called, that this Joseph was his father. Quickly, the Word of God, he was separated. He was the Word. And the Word corrected the error. Know ye not that I must be about my father's business. That was not just that little 12-year-old boy. That was the Word of God speaking through his little childish mouth to correct error, separating like he did in the beginning, darkness from light. Alive from the truth, death from life. It's a separation 
Always the word requires total and complete separation. Regardless, Jesus said, let every man's word be a lie. Let mine be true. All down through the ages, the same thing has happened. It's the separating. Always he separates his people from the unbelief. He did it at the beginning. He does it the same today. Each one of the prophets was separated from unbelief. The reason they did that is because the word of the Lord came to them. Now, I believe in a night somewhere, perhaps a sheer Sunday or last night, that I was speaking what the word seer in the Old Testament meant. It meant a man, a diviner, a man that would tell the future events that were coming to pass. And then when they come to pass exactly, without failure, come to pass exactly what he said, then God said, listen to this man, or hear him, fear him, for I'm with him. Then he had the divine interpretation of the written word, for that was his credentials of identification that he was God's prophet and the word come to him. Amen. Right. Now, separation. It separated Isaiah from the church world. It separated Moses from the church world. It separated the, uh, all the, the great prophets to the ages from the church world because they had it separated Jesus from his brethren. It separated the apostles from the church. It was at that day the Pharisees, Sadducees, great man, holy man, good man, fine man, humble man, man that had fruit of the Spirit, more so than what Jesus exercised. But what was his credentials? That the Word was with him. The Word promised of that day was living through him. He said, which one of you can condemn me of sin? Which one of you can say that what I have claimed hasn't happened? That for he showed that he was a separated Nazarite of the Lord. He was the Lord himself in flesh. Abraham also, he was a separated person from the world. When God called Abraham at 75 years old, separate yourself from your kindred and from all your, the unbelief and come out into a world that you've never walked in before and amongst the people that you've never known before. Come out and separate yourself from anybody that would be contrary to what you're believing, that you would be a Nazarite unto the Lord because he was holding a promise of a son. He had to separate from his father, from his mother, from his kindred. And what separated him? Not because he was a good man, but because he believed that God was able to keep the promise he had given. And when he was 25 years later, and the baby had never come, Sarah being 90, he 100, and when the angel of the Lord visited him, as Jesus referred to, that would come again in the last days, God, in a human form, sat down before him and talked. And Sarah, being almost 100 years old, in the tent behind him, laughed because the angel said, I will visit you according to the time of the promise. And she said, me being old and would have pleasure again with my Lord seeing he's old. And this man, which was God in flesh, said, why did Sarah laugh in the tent? Now, she ran out and tried to deny it. But he said, yes, but you did laugh because it she didn't believe it could be right. Now notice, Jesus said that would come again as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. Again, the Spirit of God will come upon mortal human flesh. That man eat the meat of a calf, drinking the milk from the cow, and eat butter and bread in human flesh, and Abraham said he was Elohim, God manifested in flesh. Jesus promised that God, before his coming, would be manifested in human flesh again. That's the Holy Spirit. He's only one God. Manifesting itself, separating again Lot from Abraham. Lot wanted the world. God set, tore up his world and separated 
Abraham and Lot, Lot being a type again of a carnal believer who didn't think these things were true. He just went on down in Sodom and he, he didn't have the real spunk to stand out, as we call it, and call what was right, right, and wrong, wrong. So he went down. All these believers, as we could go on for hours, all these were like a bunch of change out of your pocket in God's hand. You pull out a bunch of change. There's pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, Half a dollar, dollar, all in coins. Now that's what the world is in God's hand. There's some people that just can have a penny's worth of it, and God can only use them in a penny way. That's all they can buy. Don't reject them. If they can't believe the real truth, don't turn them down. Don't kick them out and say they're not in it because God uses pennies sometimes. Lot was just a penny. Abraham was a silver dollar. So it had taken a hundred lots to make an Abraham. So it would take a hundred carnal believers who will never stand in the presence of a genuine Christian that's separated from the carnal things of the world. Living in Christ Jesus where the word can flow through him. He can only take a penny's worth. That's all he's got. So you see people say, oh, I don't believe in healing. I don't believe in these things. Just know it's a penny, but just let him alone. Just a penny's worth. And so that's all he can buy. Don't stop him. Just let him alone. Remember, that's just all farther he can go. Joseph, he was separated from his brethren. Yeah, I didn't mean that hard in that way that I said it. See, I mean, if he just, well, I belong to this and that's what we believe, it's just a penny. Go ahead. See, just a penny. Say, well, the Lord bless you, my brother. See, he's copper. He can never be silver. <laughs> So just let it go ahead. God can use him. Oh, he's using it. I'd rather see him down there in a church and see a bar room standing there on the corner, wouldn't you? Sure. So just let it alone. God can use it anyhow. Maybe not very much, but he'll use what he can use as much as they'll let him use. So that's kind of a rude way to express anything. But I, well, I hope you get the truth that I mean, what, what it's meant. See, he can't believe in the discernment and the powers of God as promised for this day. Those Pharisees couldn't do it either. They couldn't see Jesus being God. Oh, no, you make yourself God a man. One day he was standing there after you'd multiplied loaves of bread and so forth for them. And he said, um, unless you eat the, the bread, uh, the Son of Man's body, and drink his blood, uh, there's no life in you. Oh, imagine this congregation. They walked away from him. This man expects us to be a cannibal, eat somebody's flesh. Oh, that's crazy. Doctors, medical doctors and so forth said, the man's insane. That's all there is. The priest is right. That man is crazy. Give us his body to eat. That's all he said. See, but the spiritual mind, maybe they could not understand it, those disciples. They didn't know just exactly what it meant, but they believed it anyhow. Because where did it come from? It come from the one they know to be the Son of God. I might not be able to understand all in the year, but I believe it. It's God's word. I want to separate myself from anything that's contrary to it. I tried to stand like that. Notice another group, the 70 he had called. One day he was standing talking to them, and he said, The Son of Man shall ascend up into heaven from whence he come from. They said, This man, he's taken us to the place he was born. We know his mother, Mary. Well, we know his brothers. We know all. And then this man's going to take it. The Son of Man is coming, going up into heaven from whence he come from. He come from Bethlehem. How did he do that? See, he said it in that way. See? And they walked with him no more. They walked away. They said, Oh, this man, we know there's something wrong with him. Them disciples sat right there. See? They believed. They had seen the promised word for that day vindicated and manifested by him. Who could create but God himself could take bread? And they wrote he was the Son of God. Whether it was in riddles or not, that whether they understood it or not, they walked right on anyhow because the word was vindicated and they were separated from anything contrary to it. God help us to have faith like that. We believe this Bible to be the truth. I may not have faith enough to make all the promises come to pass, but I believe it anyhow. Amen. I believe the hour that we're living. Joseph separated from his brethren without a cause. Now, what was the matter with him? He was not willing to be separated. It wasn't his will to separate, but they separated themselves from him. See? From his bright, shiny dollar, 
their pennies worth couldn't stand it. They know they were patriarchs. They know that Isaac was their, uh, pardon me, Jacob was their father. And they know that to be true. But Joseph was born, he couldn't help it. He was spiritual. He saw visions, could interpret dreams, and they were perfectly right. Whatever he said was the truth. And his patriarch brothers moved with envy and sold him to the Egyptians. See, they, they separated themselves from him because they were pennies. He was of a different quality. So he's a real believer today. He's of a different quality. They'll separate themselves. They don't understand it. Copper from silver. Now, we find out they move with envy and sorting. Why? They do the same thing today. What it really was, they said they were, it was for jealousy. They didn't want to break down because if the quality in them were not the quality that was in him, and because of it, they were jealous because they were pennies and he was a dollar. See? Now, if the pennies say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, my brother dollar here. See? I can't make the change that he does, but I'll make what I can. <laughs> That's that. We go along then. God will get his program over. As I preached to you Sunday, the great symphony of God's Word being beat out. The changes and junctions is only God changing times like the, the director in the symphony. When we see these changes of ages and changes of times, look down on the sheet here and you'll find out we're supposed to be here. Amen. They've got to do this. There's no way for them to keep from it. And the music to a man that doesn't understand the symphony, what is it? It's a bunch of rattling noise. He doesn't understand it. He's not even interested. He's wishing, I wish you'd shut up so I could go home. He's not interested because he doesn't know the sympathy. He doesn't know it. But the composer knows the end from the beginning. Right. See? And if the director isn't in the same spirit of the composer, he cannot act it out because it's all done by signs. And if the sign don't vindicate it, how's the musician's going to play it? Amen. Amen. That's it. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who can, can who know how to prepare for war, retreat, or what doing? Look at the word and see where we're living. Then you can see pennies, what they do. But you can see those who are glistening, watching and knows the word, watching for these signs to happen. There it is. Like the little woman at the well, when he said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. said, that's right, she got five. She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We haven't had him for hundreds of years. But we know the Messiah is coming and he is going to be a prophet. That's what he'll do. He said, I'm he. Oh, the sympathy beat went just exactly right. From the low pump to the high. She ran into the city and said, come see a man who's told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah that we look forward to? Certainly. See, she understood what the sheet music was in the sympathy that separates belief from unbelief. Faith can only not come by a church. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, knowing what it is. Now, we find the same thing today. Many people look at gifts. In closing now, five more minutes. People look at gifts, and they think, oh, what a great thing. And they try to impersonate gifts. You can't do that. You just, you can't make a, a, a penny be a dollar. You can't make it be a dime. You can't make it be a nickel. Penny. But if you just recognize yourself as a penny, go with the rest of change. See? God can use you. We might not be able to do all. There wasn't everybody when God called Israel out of Egypt. Every one of them didn't have to do the same thing Moses did. But they believed it. Amen. Right? They believed Moses because they know that it was a sign of the hour. And that God had proved that he had his word. They said, Pharaoh's got spears. He said, but Moses has his word. That's it. Pharaohs might have an army, but Moses had the word because he was God's prophet and the word come to him and had been vindicated that it was the truth. It was a living God who could take dust and throw it up and make fleas come. A man can't do that. There's a man that stood there and said, tomorrow about this time it'd be such and such. And it was. See? They know Moses had God's word. 
no matter how many spears and dungeons Pharaoh had and how many bricks to make, Moses had the word. So they started into the wilderness. There was a man, Dathan, said, Moses takes too much upon himself. We're all holy people, so we all ought to be able to do what Moses did. And Moses said, God, what about this? He said, separate yourself. Get away from him. And he opened up the earth and swallowed up Dathan and his group. He separated light from darkness by vindicating his word. He's the same God today. Closing. I was telling you last night, when I first come here, this is not personal. If you think that, then please just pull down the curtains to your heart. I'm saying this to people who believe. It was spoken, told exactly what things would take place down through the age, and you're all witnesses. That is your witness last night. From the discernment on down, how to be impersonators, impersonating, and everything take place. But the last thing was to be a great thing would take place. We've been watching for it for years. We all know when it happened first, when a creation come into existence. The third time. And then the fourth time, last night I told you the fifth time it happened, and it's waiting for this council of churches. When it unites in the Protestants, if I speak Sunday morning, that's what I, want, I mean, Saturday morning, that's what I want to speak on. See? Now, and then when this gets together, then the Spirit of God always raises a standard against them. There's a man sitting here tonight who's a witness of this. I was in Colorado not long ago, this last fall. I go up there on hunting trips, and it's, usually I'm up there on my wedding anniversary. When my wife and I got married, I, I'd saved off my nickels and things and from my work and had them in a baking powder can. And I didn't have enough to take a honeymoon and go hunting, so I just blend them together. And I took her on a hunting trip for a honeymoon. So since then, I, to my shame, I have never been home with her on her anniversary. I was in Colorado. Last night, I seen two or three ministers which here that was with me up there in a camp where I had to come down from Alaska and meet him hunting. It was the Martin boys. They were sure last night. I, they here, right back there. And then that other little fellow, I forget his name, said, were you there too, Sonny? That's right. And um, uh, maybe uh, uh, his Brother Palmer here. Right? And we were up in the mountains, and I'm a guide in Colorado. I've hunted in there for years. And every time our anniversary, 23rd of October, comes along, there's a little place where I've taken the wife on our honeymoon up in the Adirondack Mountains, and this place looks just like it, only that was, this is quaking ass, but here the little thicket, and up there it was birch. And I walk out there on the 23rd sometime through the day, take off my hat and thank the Lord for a good loyal wife that's been loyal and been kind to me through these years, has helped me as I go to preach the gospel. And it's been awful dry in Colorado this year as it has been across the country. And all at once, there was, I suppose there was 200 men ahead of us, or 100 men, pardon me, about 100 men ahead of us, up above the camps. And they've been shooting up there for four or five days, and I'd shot a deer, one that I'd been hunting for years. And I, but i come a fog down, and I didn't get to see him. I couldn't find him. And I'd been hunting for him that day. And the next day, the phone, or the, coming on the radio, a blizzard coming could dump 20 foot of snow in these mountains overnight. And so I said to the brethren, I called him in, the Martin boys was there also, and I said, brethren, you hear what the news said. Now, if you want to get out, you better go right now, because it's going to be too late. You might stay here for a week, and I should go, because next Monday I've got a meeting, Christian businessman, full gospel businessman, at the chapter at Tucson. However, you make your choice. If you want to stay, I'm your guide. I'll stay here with you. Every one of them voted, we'll stay, we'll stay. The Martin boys, having a low-speed truck, or high-speed truck, rather, they all, we had a couple of extra deer there. We give them to the Martin boys and that, and they went out because they wouldn't get out of there. That's all. So they, they're sitting here as a witness tonight. And then the next day I thought, well, it didn't snow that day, the day they went out. I said, I'm going to call the wife and tell her I'm um, thankful for her, her being a nice wife and all. It's her anniversary. And then tomorrow I'll go up to the place if we get up there for the snow. And so I, I went in, I couldn't call her. I come back, and everybody in town getting ready, and the big blizzard is coming, the paper says could dump 20 foot of snow in Colorado that night. Brother Tom Simpson is sitting present here somewhere tonight, or should be. He was in Canada and was on his road down, and they bypassed, they bypassed Colorado. Great blizzard. Are you here, Brother Simpson? Where are you? Uh, yes, sitting back in the back here. And they told him, bypass Colorado, great blizzard coming on. So I I told sister and, and another man's wife, Brother Evans, I don't think Brother Evans is sure tonight, that she's just coming. Are you here, Brother Evans? 
And um, I don't think he's gotten here. He'll be here at the convention home. So uh, I called his wife, and I said, I couldn't get my wife. She's gone out to the store. And I said, tell her to tell Brother Tony Stromey, which was the president of the chapter, if I'm not in there Sunday, get another speaker ready, because I may not be able to get out of here at all. I'm with these men. Then what taking place? The, that night, it didn't snow. The next morning, the clouds was real low and angry. I said, now, brethren, I've herded cattle in here for years and guided. The first little drop of rain, take back to the camp as quick as you can, because within 15 minutes, I've seen the time you couldn't see your hand before you for two or three days at a time. Twisting blizzard, that's 9,000 feet right there. And I said, you, you'll just be in a blizzard, and you'll be lost, and you'll die here in the mountains. Now, we'll go out. I placed each man. Now, I went up over the top. And I said, now, if I don't, if, don't wait for me to come in. Hurry just as quick as it starts, the first little speck of rain. Rush quickly to the campus because you won't be able to find your way back. They said they would do it. And I climbed high, coyotes hollering everywhere. I knew the weather was going to change. Then all at once, a big blast of wind come and the sleep began to fall. And I said, I guess everybody's headed back. Well, I stood and looked around. I thought, I wish I could find that deer before I go back because the snow will cover him up. They won't be found in mortal spring. So I thought I hunted so hard for that deer, and it's the first deer I ever let get by like that since I've owned this little rifle, a 55 head of game with it. And I thought, well, I, I, I just hate to see it get away like that. And just a moment, great big snowdrops looked like uh, quarters, just a falling everywhere, and the wind started blowing, and I could hardly see how to get off the top of this peak. And I know to stay on this ridge, and if I went down and hit the creek, I'd go down the creek till I hit a little footbridge, then I could feel my way up till I got to where the tent was. That's the only way you get out. And so I thought if I ever make a move one way or the other, that's all. You'll never be found. So you die right in there. So I started back down the mountain. And I got down about, oh, I guess 300 yards or 400 from where I was. Now, this sounds strange. But I got a Bible here before me, a heavenly father bearing me a record. Uh, almost in a run, trying to get off the wind is blowing so hard up there. And um, I could see about 20 feet in front of me in the thickets I was in, the timber, and the wind blowing and twisting. And a voice said, stop, go back where you come from. Well, I stopped. I thought maybe that's just the sound of that wind. I wasn't thinking about nothing like that. I waited just a moment, and one of the boys had fixed me a sandwich, and I pulled it out, and it was really a sandwich. Me raining, sweating, it's just a big lump of, of bread with some meat in somewhere. Well, I, I was kind of hungry, so I ate it anyhow. And I stand there, and I bear the little piece of paper so animals see those things, and anything of civilization, they run and get away. So I stood there a little bit, and I thought, well, I'll go on. I started on, and just as plain as you hear my voice, something said, turn and go back where you come from. How could that be God telling me to walk into that death trap? I stood there a minute, and I thought, that's the same one that said about them squirrels. The same one I told you about last night about my wife. It's the voice, it's the human voice. The same one told me when I was a little boy, I never drink or smoke, and these things would be in the last days. God and me telling this the Bible over my heart. What good would do me to tell you something wrong and know that I'm sending my soul to hell? It's true. It's unusual, but it's true. Well, I thought, I know enough to obey that voice. Why would I? He's got some reason for me to go up there. Maybe it's my time to go. So I turned and waking my way through the wilderness until I got up to that saddle again, way up, maybe uh, 300 yards, 400 above, right straight up the mountain like that again. It was so thick up there that I couldn't see out the wind, trees just laying over and twisting. And I took my rifle, I had on a red shirt and a red cap, and I put the rifle, keep them smoking up the, the scope in it because bear and stuff moving them kind of time, so does lion. And I, I run into one, the scope all smoked up, and I just held it up like this. Uh, not against me to throw the smoke, but keep the fog out of it and the wet from the snow. And I sat down under a tree. And I sat down and I thought, well, why would he want me to come up here? I, I doubt very much I can find my way down now. The getting so terrific. I could see about 10 or 15 feet, maybe getting hardly that far. Sometimes not over five feet and getting rougher all the time. Well, I, oh, well, he said, come back. All I know to do is sit here. In the snow then, about an inch, inch and a half, maybe two inches on the ground. It had been about 20, 30 minutes. And, and it's blowing so hard, it's blowing it away too. And I it sat there just a moment. I heard a voice. He said, I'm the God of heaven that created the heavens and the earth. 
I jerked off my cap. And I just sat still. Now listen again. I thought that wasn't the wind. Always blowing, making noise. And I heard again that I'm the one who still the winds upon the mighty sea. I'm the one, the creator. I created squirrels in your presence. I did these things. I said, yes, Lord. I believe you. I said, stand on your feet. I stood up to my feet. He said, now speak to the storm. It'll do what you tell it to do. Uh, that is true. Uh, when I meet you at the judgment, I'll have all this to answer for. I thought he... I said, Storm, go to your place. Stop. Said, Son, you shine normally for four days. And no more than I'd said that, the sleet and the hail which is about to blow me down just stopped. And within a moment or two, the sun was shining right down through upon me. And I looked down across the mountains. I see uh, an east wind come. The wind was coming from the west. East wind come. It was uh, coming this way. And I could see the clouds. This mysteriously, where they went, I don't know. And I stood there a few moments. Tears running down through my beard. Them gray. Oh, God. Huh. I, I don't know what to do. I thought, well, I was... I guess the brethren were all back in the tent. And the sun shining everywhere. I started walking down the mountain. Snow all drying up that hot sun, steam coming out of my shirt. Just a moment or two difference. And I started walking down the mountain. And when I did, I said, I heard a voice say, Why don't you walk with me? I said, Lord, the greatest privilege I ever had. I turned and started back down through the big deer trails, down through that virgin forest. I thought, Well, I'll walk on down that way to where I always pay my salute to me, my wife. I was going along there some about a half hour, three quarters later. Snow was all dried up and gone. And I began to think, I wonder why she has never said anything to me about going. I said, I remember when I first helped her up there and lift her over them logs when we were married. I said, now she's gray. I went, <clears throat> uh, gray beard over my face, black and gray mixed together. I thought, Bill, you ain't got much longer. You're getting old. And I started moving along. And I looked up. Looked like I could see her standing before me there with her arms out, still black-headed. I held my head down. I scored up a little place where some quaking ass, and there's a little crook, and I just leaned my head against the limb like this. I stand there crying. Now I could hear something going pat, pat, pat. And I looked down. It was the water coming from my eyes through my beard, hitting on them dry leaves. Or about 30 minutes before, there was an inch of snow, and it blizzarding. When I come down off the mountain, four days later, not one cloud in the sky for four days later, I come in, I said to the filling station man, did uh, uh, been pretty dry. Yes, said, you know the strangest thing, which predicted a storm the other day, and you know it stopped all at once. And then I come on down to the New Mexico line, coming back to Arizona, and I said to Billy, my son, I said, let's go in here and just see if it's down this way. I stopped in there on a Sunday morning, got some, uh, and I got some gasoline, and the man said, well, been hunting? I said, yes, sir. Any luck? I said, yes, sir. We had a fine time. I said, looks pretty dry. He said, yes, it's been awful dry through here. He said, we was promised a big snow the other day. and said, you know, the blizzard actually started and somehow or another it quit. Oh, my, how my. Now, standing inside this tree in closing. Standing inside this tree. The tears dropping from my eyes. I thought, God, just think. The same God that said, Peace be still to the way. Yes, Lord. And the winds obey him. He's still the same Jesus is right here in the woods with him. He's still the Word. The Word, all nature has to obey his Word, for he's a creator of nature. And I stood there and the tears dropping off of my cheeks. And for about five years now, I've been off the field just going to churches and whatever I could. You all know that. And if my heart's been burdened. I'd go out here, come to Arizona, and he would tell me things to do, and I'd go do it, but it looked like the revival's over. And I c couldn't wonder what was taking place. In my heart, I'd repent. I'd say, Lord, if I've done anything, tell me I'll make it right. But it's burdened all the time, just a horrible feeling. I couldn't have the victory that I wanted. Many great things they've done and showed, which you all are witnesses coming here and telling you about it, seeing the papers, packet, and magazines, and so forth, about the great supernatural things that's been seen and done. But my heart was still heavy. 
And I was leaning against the bush just like this. And I thought, the great God of heaven, that warm sun shining on me, not a cloud nowhere. And a few moments ago, you just, you just contradicted the man's word. Nature did it. How could it be done, Lord? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It was his word that you just had me to speak. I thought, Father, how grateful I am. I heard something. And I looked, standing right before me was two, three deer. And they were looking at me. Now, them deer had been shot at much in the last week. And there was hunters in there. And here I was dressed in red. Anyone knows if they're gone that quick. But they were looking at me. And for eating deer, there could have been no better. It was a big doe, two big full-grown fawns. And I thought, that's just right. We need three deer. Something said, you know, uh, the Lord's put them in your hands. But when I was with the full gospel businessman, Brother Clayton, about a year before he went with us when I caught that big record fish, that year for a man I killed 19 head of elk. And I, I the, it's sometimes businessmen, excuse us, my brother, some of them are doctors and, you know, they can't walk and fat, you know, and a man sat to a desk and said, Billy, give me one two-year-old, get me a blue cow, I want a buck, get me a, a full rack. Well, I just had a jubilee out there shooting, getting the elk and things. But the Lord told me not to do that. And I promised him in that blizzard over there in Colorado, not years before that, I said, Lord, I'll lead man to the game, but no more kill game for man. No. Not this is emergency. We have to have it. And if you remember, boys, the night before we left, poor little old brother uh, down there hadn't got a deer. What's his name? Uh, Palmer. Come around and put a $10 ties in my hand. He said, Brother Brandon, this is my ties put in the church. He said, will you get me a deer? Oh, stood those three deer and I had this rifle of mine on my shoulder. I slipped my shoulder like that. I thought they can't get away from me. They're right here. I too fast at the rifle and I get all three of them before they can turn around. See? And I had the rifle. I thought, there they are. Right? I just slipped the rifle and then I had to think of that promise. I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I said, I remember one time that a man told another, God has put Joab in your hands or Saul. Joab told David, David said, God forbid that I touch his anointing. That was my promise that I wouldn't do it. And I thought, they're right top of the ceiling. Roll them right down there. We can pick them up easy. Three fine deer standing there. I said, no, I can't do it. And here this coming up like that of fawns, two full-grown male and female and a mother deer. And they come walking, looking around, great big fat fellows. And I stood there a little bit and I thought, that's unusual for deer. And me with this red on like that, I thought I'll scare them. I said, you're in my hands. You couldn't get away if you wanted to, but I'm not going to hurt you. Go on. They just looked at one another and they kept coming. And they got real close to me, looking at me. Well, I set the rifle down on the ground. I said, Mother, take your babies and go on out in the woods. I'm here enjoying myself in the presence of God. I promised that I wouldn't kill game for other people. I said, now you take your babies and go on in the woods. I love that woods too. Go on out. She looked at me. Both of them looked around, all three of them. Then they turned and walked away and they come back again. I said, I'm not going to hurt you. I said, go on in the woods. You're in my hands. You couldn't get away. But I said, I've been in God's hands and yet I couldn't get away either. He spared me. I made him a promise. I'm sparing you. Go on. Have a good time. Enjoy this woods. I like it. You go on. They stood there a little while, walked up close to eat out of my hands almost, turned around and looked all at me like that, walked on all the looked back again, walked around the woods. I said, I thought, oh, that's unusual for deer. wonder if it's because that the Lord Jesus is here, his presence. And just then, a boy spoke to me, said, you remembered your promise, didn't you? I knew it was him. I said, yes, Lord. He said, so do I remember mine. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That burden lifted. Christian friends, it hasn't been back since. That was last October. I've been a different person. Keep your promise to God. Whatever you say to God, you believe it. Separate yourself from anything contrary to his word. God will hear and answer prayer. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Are you willing to separate yourself tonight from all unbelief? To hear the word of the Lord. 
if you'll do it and believe that he is the same yesterday and forever. These things, what he has promised to do, we see him doing it. Will you raise your hands and say, God, I make you a promise tonight. I believe everything that you promised. I believe every word that I never doubt from you. Our Heavenly Father, thou knowest this story to be true. That was the fourth time. And then the fifth time was with my own precious wife when you, last week when that doctor write that statement, that big tumor left before his hand touched her just according to what it said. Now, Father, I pray that you help these people. I realize that I'm getting old. I know that I must go soon. And I pray, Lord, that let me be honest and sincere with my brethren. Let me be honest and sincere with your people. If I can't be with them, then I don't think I would be with you, Lord, because I want to bear a record of you. And I pray that you'll let the Word so live in us tonight that you'll give all of us faith. And by this little gift that people think sometimes that a gift is something that you put in your hands and go out and cut your way through. A gift is not that, Father. May they understand that a gift is get yourself out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can do what it wants to do. Lord, let us get ourselves out of the way now and let the great Holy Spirit come and work through us. And may we see tonight the promises of Jesus Christ. At the one that I referred to especially tonight, Lord, that that one where God came down before Abraham, manifested in flesh, and know the secret of the heart. It was God. And when he was made flesh and dwelt among us, he knew the secret of the heart. And the Bible says that the Word of God is the discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. That's how the disciples know that he was God. Now, Father, will you come tonight and let our poor, humble tabernacles be dedicated to you, that you will cause us to believe that it's your Spirit might make itself known among us tonight that you're still the Word. Then we'll separate ourselves from all unbelief and follow you. In Jesus' name, may you speak to us. Amen. Hold up, fight him, man of valor. The Amen. Spirit of the Lord and the fight of the Lord is upon me. Even so shall the people hear thy word. It shall bring light and power and help unto me. And the angel of the Lord has spoken unto me. Even now does the Spirit of the Lord speak by misfortune to me. Be thou encouraged. Thy vision shall be renewed. Thou shalt be strengthened in thy life days. Thou shalt run and not be weary. Thy youth shall be as the eagle that renews its sack. The cry of the people is unto thee. Thy word bringeth life as the dry and the barren earth waiting for the rain. The people long it. Those that are bound, the cries of those that change, waiting for thee. This voice came not because of the only, but because of those. Great God of heaven, be merciful unto us. Help us, O Lord, to obey your commandments. Use us to thy honor. And we thank thee for these encouraging words. Now let the Holy Spirit move through us and confirm these words. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Have faith in God. Don't down. Be of a good courage. The time of his coming is drawing close at hand. Now, tonight, we've got a, a group of prayer cards. How many in your has prayer cards? Raise up your hand. It would be hard for me to go through that group and with the discernment if the Lord would give it. But let me just take a moment and say this. How many in here doesn't have prayer cards? And you're praying that God will heal you. Now may the Lord God help each one of you. I am your brother. 
Jesus is your Savior. God is our Father. We are people. We are not of this world when we're born of God. We're of above. Now, before we have the prayer line to pray for the sick, and there's a man here on the platform tonight that prays for sick too, and ministers out there that pray for sick. I don't want to leave the impression that I'm the only one who prays for the sick. See, God doesn't, he doesn't have to use me. He can, he just use you or anybody. The thing is to believe what he said to be the truth. Yes, but now that I've said this, in vindication of what has been said, let us just bow our heads just a moment, you that's praying and you're sick and do not have prayer cards, you pray. And say something like this, Lord Jesus, I know the Bible says that the prayer of faith shall save the sick, God shall raise him up. It's also said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. If he is the same, well then, he'll have to act the same, do the same. And then again, the Bible said that the, the word of God was sharper than a two-edged sword and discerned the thoughts that was in the heart. We know that when the word was made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that's exactly what God did through his Son. Jesus said in St. John 14, the works that I do should you also, even greater and more, for I go to my Father. And now, the Bible says also in the book of Hebrews that he's a high priest. Now, do we all believe that? Certainly. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Now, he is. Not I am. He is. No man is. He is. Now, a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Now, if you feel and were ready to step out and just turn yourself loose to your all unbelief and say, let me touch you, great high priest. Now, if he's the high priest and the same yesterday, today, and forever, he will act as he did then because he is the same. A woman touched him one time when he's here on earth, visibly with her hand. He felt the touch and turned around and said, who touched me? And all of them denied it. But he discerned the thoughts and he found the woman, told her what was wrong with her, and her faith had healed her. Now he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Maybe that woman didn't have a prayer card. But she had faith. And that's all that's necessary. Have faith. Touch the great physician. And by a divine gift, if I can just get myself out of the way, let the Holy Spirit say what he wants to do, do what he wishes to do. And that's a gift, not just imaginary. If it's imaginary, it won't work. If it is real, it works. That's what Jesus said. It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. So it couldn't be me. He was the Son of God. I'm a sinner saved by his grace. Just believe. Don't press, just believe. And say, Lord Jesus, let me touch you. Just pray simple. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Just pray. Everybody, stay where you are. Just pray and believe. Now your audience, 
there's hardly anyone here that I know outside of um, these Martin boys that stay here. And uh, I think this is Brother Dalton sitting down here. I'm not sure if there's colored glasses on. I'll try to bypass in there. People of which I do not know. When I made Jesus Christ come with his power, that you might see that the promise of this day, the scripture that was predicted of this day, even according to Malachi 4, it must be fulfilled. Something's got to do it. God has promised it. There's a lady sitting right out here. She's on her road to the hospital tomorrow. She's been in an accident, an automobile accident. She's hurt herself. Got inward troubles, bad arm. You don't have a you have a prayer card, lady. You know. Am I a total stranger to you? I don't know you. We don't know one. Ma'am, just heard me preach, but you know I know nothing about you. Are those things the truth? If that is, raise up your hand. God bless you. Sir, have faith you won't have to go. Your trouble's over. What did the lady touch? There's a man sitting right behind her. Can't you see that light? We got an amber colored light moving. It's a man sitting right behind her. He's praying about something. It's a brother that's in the hospital. You believe that God will heal your brother? Give him back his right mind and everything, make him white. You believe that? I'm a stranger to you. Is that right? That's a con Believe. All right. We can have. What did he touch? Here's a lady right back behind that sitting back here. She's, see that light? Can you see it? Look here. Look, everybody look. See right here? Have an amber looking circle. Right below it is a lady. She's here. She's praying for someone. It's two children, grandson, great grandson. The lady is not from here. She's from California. And she's come here requesting prayer. Also, there's somebody with her. It's her sister. She sits right back here with that red dress on. She has epilepsy. That is true. She's from California. You brought her with her. Your name is Mary. You believe with all your heart. Are those things true? Wave your hand if it's true. You believe with all your heart? Then you can have what you ask for. Now, if anybody wants to ask the people if I knew them, do you have a prayer card, lady? You don't. You don't need it. Here, here's a man sitting right back here looking at me. On the end of the row. He's got trouble with his knees. If he believe that God will heal him knees, you have what he's praying about. You believe it? All right. Your knee trouble's over, sir. You have a prayer card? You don't have a prayer card? You don't need it. Now, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. A lady sitting here has got female trouble. You believe? There's a lady. Oh my. You're miss Got a red coat. Her name is Miss Daly. Believe with all your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ make you well, Miss Daly. Asked if I know the lady. I've never seen her in my life. The Heavenly Father knows that. You say, what'd you call her name? Well, Jesus said, your name is Simon. You're the son of Jonas. Is that right? Now, isn't that him the same yesterday, day, and forever? Do you believe that to be the truth? Now, what did Jesus say? This will occur. And remember, that was the last sign that was given to the elected church, Abraham and his bunch, before the promised son appeared. Is that right? God will give Abraham signs all along the journey, and so has he the church. But when the angel of the Lord come down into that, he destroyed the unbelieving Gentiles, and the expected son that had been waited for appeared, Isaac. 
This ministry will end soon. And the expected son will appear himself. The church has come from justification through the Lutheran, sanctification through the Western, into the baptism of the Holy Ghost through the Pentecostals, and now winding up to the headstone. Ministry typing all the time right into that perfect negative shadow becoming positive. And Jesus will come to catch his church someday, those who believe. Separate yourself from unbelief and believe tonight. Will you do it? Let those who have prayer cards now, beginning, I believe I prayed up to 25. Right? Is that right? I think that's what was set out. Number 125, now 26, 27, 28, 30. Line up over here with prayer cards. Number one, line up on this side over here. Will you do it now? Now, we have the discernment line without the prayer cards so that people say, I was reading what was on the prayer card. There was, then people had no prayer card. They're just people sitting there. And now, it goes on. How many have seen that go for a half hour at a time or more like that? See, and things take place. But you see, we got to hold on strength. I've got 40 some odd meetings ahead of me around down through the south. And now, move over here. Use your prayer cards. Move over on this side. All with A prayer cards. Come over on this side over here. Prayer cards, A. Now, the rest of us, let us sing. To God only believe. Will you do that? All of us together. Oh, that's all. Just believe what? Believe his word. Oh. transgressions with his stripes we were healed. Is that right? See, he's already did it. It's in the past. You say, Lord, save me. He's already did it. No matter how much you cry to pray and beat on the bench, it won't save you until you believe and accept what he's done for you. Is that right? Same thing it is. I do not heal people. I can't heal people. But what would he do? If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he would do just what he did now. For that's what he promised for the day. How many knows that that's what he's promised? He's promised Yes, sir. He promised it. And all the scriptures, you all take the tapes, the seven church ages and things. See, those things proven by the scripture that it's right. Now, to you standing in this prayer line, to come down that line of discernment, Jesus saw one vision and he said, I perceive that virtue has gone from me. That strength, is that right? Visions, you're in another world. Now, he's here. That's him that you touch. See? Now, it just only identifies that he's here with us. Now, how many will believe? If we just walk through this line, let me pray, lay hands up on you, and you go back to your seat. Do you believe I'll pray for you here and then lay hands on you? Each one of you get well. You believe that was the Holy Spirit here? You can just keep on doing it. If you want to forfeit that line and just keep on for some more, well, we'll do that. See, that's what the Holy Spirit's here. See, it's not, it's just up to uh, your thinking. If it make you believe more, but many people has been taught, lay hands on them. The Bible said he sent his word and healed them. Well, that's what he did just now. Confirmed his word, sent it to you, confirmed it, and it healed him. The Gentiles said, Jew said, come lay hands on my daughter, she'll live. The Romans said, I'm not worthy, come under my roof, just say the word. That's what I'm trying to get you to believe, you see. 
But if you want, be prayed for and hands laid upon you. Now, I want every one of you to join with me in prayer as we pray for the people. Let us bow our heads. Lord Jesus, I pray for the people now. They're aware that you're standing here. They know that you're in the midst of the people. And when these people pass over this platform tonight, may they not come just coming by me, your servant, or these other servants of yours sitting here. May they realize that they're coming to the temple of the living God. They're coming under a promise that God said, These signs shall follow them that will believe. When they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. He promised that. He promised that every man that would believe would be saved. And every man that does believe gets saved. Everyone that believes in healing gets healed. Father, help our unbelief now. You've identified yourself here tonight scripturally to show us that you're here. Now let it come to pass that every person that comes across this platform or in this audience, may there not be a feeble person among us when the service is over. May the great Holy Spirit come among his people and anoint us every one, Lord, all these ministers, all these servants of yours sitting here, by the hundreds. Father, I pray that each of our prayers will go to you while we're in the divine presence of your being. And may these people understand as they pass this platform that tonight is the night of their healing, if they can believe. Now I want everyone to continue in prayer as the people come by, and I'll be laying hands upon each one for their healing. Come, sir. I pray for this, my brother, in the name of Jesus Christ. To be I pray for this, my brother, in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for my sister in the name of Jesus Christ for her I pray for my sister in the name of Jesus Christ for her I pray for my sister in Jesus' name for her healing. I pray for my sister in Jesus' name for her healing. I pray for my brother in the name of Jesus Christ for her I pray for my sister in the name of Jesus Christ for her I pray for my brother in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for my brother in Jesus' name of Jesus. I lay hands upon our brother in the name of Jesus Christ for his name. I lay my hands upon this brother in Jesus' name for his name. My hands laid upon this brother, I ask for his name in Jesus' name. All these in the divine presence here now. Thirty or seven, something like that. Six thirty or seven. So we'll have prayer line again tomorrow night. I'm sorry that I kept you a little late tonight on account of the prayer line. May God bless you. Now let us bow our heads again. As we pray, Father, we forgive every man his sin against us. If there be found anything in us that's unlike you, forgive us, Lord. For we are told that we are to be written epistles of God, read of all man. 
And as we have obeyed your commandments, seen your presence, identifying yourself with us, people has walked up this platform testifying of their faith. We've laid hands upon them, Father. Not just as one of us, but all of us together in prayer. We've laid hands upon them, believing that you will heal their bodies. You said when you were here on earth, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Jesus, of Son of God, that was your promise, Lord. And the one that made the promise has identified himself here tonight to fulfill his promise. So it has been carried out, your commandments, laying hands on the sick. Now, let it be done. It's been written, let it be done. Let the power of Jesus Christ break tonight and separate yes. every person in here from any unbelief. Amen. And let the presence of Jesus Christ, the Word who knows the thoughts of our heart, let it take preeminence tonight in every heart. And we rebuke Satan and all of his powers of darkness, all of his powers of unbelief. The Spirit of God has raised up a standard against you, Satan. You are a defeated being. Jesus Christ defeated you at Calvary. He raised up the third day triumph over death, hell, and the grave. He has sent it on high and give gifts to man. He's sharing person tonight. He said, a little while in the world will see me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. We see his presence here tonight fulfilling his word. By faith, we believe that every sick person in here shall be healed for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And the people said, Amen. God bless you. Back to the brother.